and Calvinism and Orthodoxy. So we have Redeemed Zoomer and Jay Dyer. For Calvinism actually holds a bunch of those same positions that are condemned in the first seven councils, like monothelitism, monoenergism, and the story. Oh, since, since when are Calvinists monothelitists? Where, where are you getting that from? The debate about monothelitism turns into a debate about monoenergism. So monoenergism is what the result of the monothelite debate is. How do Calvinists agree with that? Because you believe in monoenergism and conversion. Monergism is not the same as monoenergism. Yes, it is. It's the end result of that. The debate that Maximus has with Pyrrhus is identical to the debates that the Protestants have about conversion. How so? How, how is mono, mono energism the if same I as overcome the human energy? That's the debate that Maximus has with Pyrrhus. And so the Calvinist position of mono energism in anthropology is already condemned at the Sixth Council when it rejects Pyrrhus's anthropology. So that's you're saying that the logical conclusion of mono energism is, is Calvinist. That's just because you believe that's a logical conclusion. It also affirms the essence energy distinction in human anthropology which means that man has free will so is there like some reformed confession that says no the fifth and sixth councils were wrong we actually believe in mono energism and monothelitism where does it say that doesn't that's not even required i don't have to have that if if you guys affirm mono energism and conversion because the same argument is refuted at the sixth council so i don't need you to say i affirm mono energism in Christology and I reject the Sixth Council. If you have the equivalent belief, it doesn't really matter. So I still, this is the first time I've ever heard of this. I've always rejected monoenergism, monothelitism while holding to a Calvinist view of conversion. I've never seen any contradiction yeah. there. I don't think there is any contradiction. It's an anthropological view that's monoenergism, right? The, don't you believe that the divine grace has to overcome the human will? The providentially god changes the the human heart yes not just providentially it's also the holy spirit overcoming the human will that's the classical reformation teaching does the holy spirit not have the power to do that uh it's not a question of power it's a question of whether there's synergy and whether man always retains his natural faculties and his in his human nature so for your position basically man loses his natural faculties and you have a you have it not just a christological but an anthropological heresy so you're saying that ma mankind needs to have free will in matters of salvation all the time or it's monoenergism? Correct. So if, that, if, if that's true, then post, you know, resurrection, uh, how do we know we're not just going to, how do we know humanity is not just going to fall again if there's going to be free will post-resurrection? Oh, you mean the Eskimo one? Yeah. Yeah, because this is the problem that's posed with all Augustinian systems, which is called dialectical willing. So in the Augustinian position, you're, cho you're forced to an, either a choice between good or evil as the determiner of what free will is. And in the Orthodox view, we explicitly reject that free will is a choice between multiple goods, not a choice between good and evil. So there's multiple, so if, multiple goods to will in the eschaton. If free will is not a choice between good and evil, then why do we why do people need a free will decision in this life to choose between having faith and not having faith? Well, it's a question of uh, how humans are made such that free will in the patristic definition pretty consistently is the ability to choose different outcomes or different options. So, for example, Adam and Eve had free will. Uh, when there was no evil to choose. And so that necessitates that in the eschaton, there will always be free will, even when evil doesn't exist. And so the, the argument then is that there's no beatific vision, for example, because the beatific vision just means there's one thing to will, the divine essence. But if there's multiple goods, multiple things to will, that's how you preserve free will without a dialectical definition. But if you go back to Libido Dominandi and what Augustine talks about in uh, uh, City of God, he defines free will as the choice between good and evil and whether the will is directed towards God at all times or whether it's directed towards creatures. And because for him, sinning is always in some way willing towards creatures, he could never admit the possibility of mo willing multiple goods. There's a really good book on this called Free Choice in St. Maximus that goes through this whole critique of the Augustinian um, collapse of willing. And this is because Augustine collapses person into nature.
uh, in the triad, uh, just as well as in uh, anthropology. And so this is what happens in Calvinism. When in Calvinism, you get the collapsing of uh, 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 a person into nature and humans, which means this is why all humans are damned in Adam in the Calvinistic view. So oh, yeah. damned in Adam because Adam is seen as an arc, uh, as a as a figure containing all of the archetypes of the humans that would come to be, right? So he's the archetype. Yeah. And, and so when he sinned, he basically brought damnation upon all of his descendants. But this is actually a collapsing of person into nature heresy, which is based on the collapsing of person into nature in the triad, which basically Calvinists all uh, default. They default to adopting their Augustinian collapsing of uh, person into nature in the Trinity as well. due to how does, how does Augustine collapse person into nature in the Trinity? He explicitly argues that person is nature in on the Trinity. I've not heard of that. I've, I'm not sure if Calvinists would agree with him on that. If he said that, which I'm not sure of. So, what do you mean by collapsing person into nature? Does that mean Augustine did not believe it was one nature and three persons? No, it means that he was inconsistent because he was trying to use a lot of Neoplatonic ideas to figure out how to philosophically argue for uh, divine simplicity and the unity of God, the being of God, and then later on to try to figure out how there's distinctions in that in that primal uh, unity. So he came up with things like relations of opposition. He came up with things like speculating about the human psychological analogy to mind and will and spirit and breath all of which are not accurate in terms of the ontological trinity. So that's why the first, the second ecumenical council, it didn't accept the Augustinian doctrine of the trinity. The second ecumenical council accepts almost wholesale the Cappadocian doctrine of the trinity. So by the way, if you wanna be orthodox in terms of Trinitarian theology, you gotta accept Constantinople one. You can't accept the Calvinist Augustinian model of the trinity. So you'll agree that the Calvinist model of the trinity is consistent with Augustine? Uh, yeah, on most points, including the filioque. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you're you're in the camp that agrees that Augustine taught some sort of filioque, right? Of course. I mean, he's explicit in uh, on the Trinity many passages. In fact, Lyons and Florence both quote that section in on the Trinity when they're arguing for what the filioque is. So the double eternal hypostatic procession quote in Lyons and Florence is from on the Trinity of Augustine. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, th I know that we definitely need to talk about the filioque because that's like the, the biggest thing here. Well, first, hold on. before we go to that, though, before we go to filioque, I, well, I'll let you make your, your point there. I, there's one point I want to ask you about, too. Go I was going to go back to the monoenergism. I'm still not understanding. So can you briefly define monoenergism and then define, then explain how Calvinism is that? What? Right. So monoenergism in Christology is... Mm -hmm that in Christ the human will had to be overcome or supplanted and so the divine will and energy functions to do that so while uh, somebody might be a monophysite they might think okay I can admit maybe there's two, there's a duality in Christ maybe it's even some kind of duality of human and divine but his will and his operation are somehow a blended thing because or or the divine takes over the human will and the idea was that the human will was so fallen and so damned that in christ if he assumes our nature and if he's going to assume the nature that he <clears throat> he wants to heal <clears throat> he's going to have to overcome the natural antipathy that the human willing has against the divine will and so max right. the long debate in Maximus's book, Disputation with Pyrrhus, where they start arguing about the text in the garden uh, where Jesus is saying, let this cup pass from me. And Pyrrhus says that that's proof that <clears throat> Christ, that the, the divine will in Christ supplants and takes over the human will because the human will doesn't want to die. And so it's naturally in antip, there's an, a natural antithesis between the human will and the divine will. And Maximus goes to great lengths to, to point out that in human nature, even after the fall, there's there's not a natural antipathy because everything that God creates is good. So there's no such thing as evil nature. That would be Manichaean. It would be a Gnostic kind of heresy to say that nature takes on the potentiality or the power of being evil. There's no such thing as an evil nature because that would be to make God a creator of evil. And God says, of yeah, of course, there's no evil nature. So 
man, even though man's fallen in the, in Maximus's uh, argumentation, that text is the same natural will pre and post fall. And so the fallen will is not in itself evil, but it does have the desire to free from uh, flee from pain. It does have proclivity to sin, but it's still not in itself inherently sinful. And he argues that for Christ to assume the nature that's consubstantial with us, the nature that we possess then must also be identical to the nature that Christ assumed. So we yeah. have our, in our natures, uh, uh, body, mind, soul, will. That's the na- that's the natural faculties. And then the person is the be- the, the individual or the subject of the agent that has that nature. Yes. Christ assumed universal human nature. That means he assumed everybody's nature, and that's why everybody's resurrected. In Calvinist yes. way, uh, there's not an explanation as to why all men are resurrected, because Calvinists do not believe that Christ assumed universal human nature. Calvinists believe that he died basically only for the elect. And so while there might be common grace mm-hmm. extended to the non-elect, Christ is not assuming universal human nature, and therefore he does not raise all human beings. So then the question... Uh, that's that's not entirely well, true. The question then becomes for the Calvinist or for the Augustinian, then why does God raise all human beings? And their answer is he just wills to. But the question, but the question is, but if resurrection is only on the basis of union with Christ's resurrected human nature, and if reprobates are not united to Christ, then why is their nature resurrected? So Calvinism does not necessarily teach that Christ did not assume universal human nature. There's many Calvinists who have taught that. And Karl Barth really taught that. I'm not saying Karl Barth is like an authority for Calvinists. He's not at all. But Karl Barth was drawing on a lot of other elements of the Calvinist well, tradition. Calvinist, that teach. Barth's a universalist. I don't know why you'd want to cite a, a modernist universalist. He's not a universalist. It's, I don't even know what he is. But the point is, he's more of like, he more than actually being in a, a theologian for anything, he basically brings to mind a lot of recovered reform doctrines that have been forgotten. Um, like his doctrine that election is fundamentally in Christ. It's really Christ that's the elect. Like that exists in Calvin. That exists in Knox. That exists in the Westminster Confession. But that was just forgotten about. So Wait, it's what? Christ that's the What do you mean? Uh, election is not some abstract decision of the Father. Election is in Christ. And of course you would agree with that because that's just in Ephesians. Um, but a lot of Calvinists had forgotten about that. And we're talking about election like it was just some abstract decision the Father made separate from the person okay. of Christ. Well, Bart does teach universalism, and this is a big contention between him and Van Til. They had an argument over this. And so, I mean, maybe there's a later Bart retraction or so, something like that. I don't know. I'm not a, I mean, I it's mean pretty- Bart, Bart explicitly said, I do, I am not a universalist. I do not teach universalism. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not using Bart as an authority. Here. Okay. So, so even if he's not, uh, if Christ resurrects uh, all human beings and they're united to him on the basis of, universal human nature then you're going to have to have the nature person distinction to explain why the wicked uh are in uh, are in hades or in hell in the eschaton and not and not in theosis or in grace because this this is the orthodox argument at this point is precisely that the distinction between the mode of willing according to individual hypostases is precisely what decides your experience of the eschaton so that requires you having free will to have that argument that's maximus's argument against universalism is that because you have to recapitulate the virtues via your own mode of willing so christ doesn't assume everybody's hypostasis he assumes everybody's uh nature we agree with that yes no you don't that's not that is not a calvinist teaching not at all what what, what confession says we disagree with that you don't because that requires free will that requires synergy so what, what you're doing is you're saying that Calvinists don't teach X because X is inconsistent with Y. There's no... no I mean, there, that is not a classical Reformation teaching. Maybe some Calvinist somewhere teaches that, but that's not the classical Reformation teaching. Usually what happens is there's some sort of... Uh, Calvinists will like nuance a certain doctrine and then everyone's be like, oh, they denied it. For example, like the eternal generation of the sun. Mm-hmm. Calvinists have a different nuance of what that means than like a traditional Roman Catholic or Lutheran position. But then that leads a lot of Catholics and Lutherans to say Calvinists are denying this doctrine. Look, for example, it's also true. Calvinism, no, but- Calvinism does teach that Jesus died for all people in some sense. But because of we have this limited atonement thing, some people think yeah. Calvinism does not teach Jesus this died is for diff- all people. Okay, but this is different from what okay. Max argument is about the distinction between nature and person and in, in individual human beings and how that determines your experience of the eschaton so maximus is not saying that your 
place in the eschaton is determined on the basis of unconditional election. Ma Maximus is saying that what your experience, because we're all going to the same eschaton because Christ assumed everybody's nature, yeah. what determines your experience of the eschaton will be the mode of willing that you did, that you engaged in in this life, whether to recapitulate the virtues or to choose evil and vice. And that is not the Calvinistic doctrine, which is basically, it argues that your determination in the eschaton is number one, based on God's decision in the divine decree. And number two, it's based on the fact that you didn't have uh, saving sola fide faith in Christ, right? That's not the Orthodox Maximus doctrine at all. Sure, but how does that mean that Calvinists don't distinguish between person and nature? Because the argument that everybody is in Adam as in an archetype is based on the removal of the distinction between nature and person and humans. It's an yeah. argument argument that collapses nature and person in anthropology. So all of us are consubstantial with Adam. We're not the same person as Adam though. So right. I'm not I'm not guilty of Adam's actions. So you've collapsed nature to person to do to make that move. Okay, I, I can see what you're saying. So you're saying that if we have a nature person distinction, the fact that Adam personally sinned shouldn't corrupt the entire human nature for the no, entire human race. No, it means that I'm not liable for his, I'm not guilty for his actions. The, the corruption can be passed on, not the guilt. I think what some Protestants have said about this is that it's not just nature that's inherited from Adam, that it's also like personhood. Like in some sense, all of us did personally sin. No. In Right. That's what I'm saying is the collapsing of nature into person, which you just admitted right there. Correct. That's the Calvinist view, and I'm saying that's what we reject. That is based on collapsing person into nature and anthropology. Well, just because you're saying that per there's some personal union of all people with Adam, that does not necessarily mean you're completely collapsing nature into person. It's not black or white. I'm not, uh, again, it is though, because for me to uh, be represented by adam does not mean that i'm personally in adam before i exist this is why scripture says in ezekiel that i'm not guilty for the sins of my fathers the corruption and the the effects of the sin can pass on just like for example you know if a mom uh does crack and she has a crack baby the baby is not guilty for the mom's sin of crack because sin in james is a specific action of the will right james says that desire or passion or concupiscence when it is uh, conceived it gives birth to sin so the desires themselves are not the sin and by the way calvinism classically and lutheranism has, has classically said that the desires themselves are actually sin as well and yes. they say because if sin is defined as a specific act of the will against the divine law or against the you know the the moral law then infants aren't guilty because they're not rationally making the decision to sin so Calvinists and Lutherans, at least classically, agreed that concupiscence is sin. They yeah, we believe that. Um, yeah, we definitely believe that. Okay, well, um, my point right there. Your, your point but about what? State of being, it's not actually an act of the will. In in some sense, you could say that, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily dispute that. Okay, so if sin is a state of being, then now you've admitted that God creates, because being refers to existence, now you're admitting that God creates sin. No, God creates un. God creates the the natures. God creates stuff, and sin is not. So how is that? So, so it can't be both. It can't be a a state of being, and an action of the will. It's got to be either one. So if it's a state of being, then how do you avoid Manichaeanism? It's a corruption of being. You, creation. The Bible says creation. But, oh, is hold on. So, now you're equivocal because we're talking about guilt. Whether infants are guilty for concupiscence or for having uh sinful you know passions or whatever you said it's a state of being are they guilty for that state of being well yes because we believe in original sin well we believe in original uh sin but not original guilt so that's the, the that's the point i'm making here is that i'm not guilty for somebody else's actions and that's why scripture says in ezekiel that the son shall not be held liable for the sins of the father so, I mean, do you think Romans 5 is contradicting Ezekiel? How are, how are both of those passages reconciled? My, my position reconciles the two because what's passed on is the consequences of the sin, not the guilt of the sin. And so that's why it becomes a debate about the passions and concupiscence, whether those themselves are sin. 
And so you're you're admitting the reform position, the classical reformation position that yes, infants are guilty because they possess sinful passions or desires. But the point is that that makes sin now a state of being and not a specific action of the will, because infants are not using their will to the to uh, rationally make the choice against God's commandments. Well, there's a difference between sin and sins, as I'm sure you know. So children should no, not be punished for the sins of your father. Your position, but that's we would say that there's no such thing as sin as a state of being because that's Manichaean. So if there is no such thing, if there's no such thing as um, inherited sin, if like you're comp- no. if every yeah right right there's no okay yeah you, that's what you believe. So if that's the case, then could a baby theoretically be born and not sin at all? Sure, because sin is a specific act of the will. And so if, if, that, if that's, that's true, could a baby could a baby be born? Could someone be born and grow up and just never sin? Well, now you said grow up, right? Isaiah talks about before the child comes to the age to know to choose the good versus the evil. So there is a point in each child's life where they get to the age where they do know the difference between good and evil. I mean, that might differ from child to child in terms of you know their level of maturation and how fast they mature. But they're not guilty of, it, of any actions until they... Guilt is, is hypostatic, is what I'm trying to say. Personal. Guilt is not a sure. fact. A feature of nature and Calvinism is predicated on guilt in nature. Sure. Let's so if if that's the case, so every um when the child grows up and when they do know the difference between good and evil, they still have a free will choice whether to choose good or evil, right? Right. So could someone grow up and be faced with uh, choices between good and evil and choose the good every time? No, because uh, of our fallen state and because of the presence of concupiscence or the passions, uh, we are we tend to choose sinful actions. You tend to choose sinful actions, but is it possible? Like, let's say the a child grows up, the first time they have a, a, a choice between good and evil, could they make a good choice the first time? Yes. What about the second time? Yeah. What about the third time? Well, it's not going to happen that they ever do this consistently throughout their life because is a proclivity so the proclivity so even though i can't tell you specifically at what point they will they will choose that but that doesn't mean that it's necessary it's a different type of necessity look at like leibniz he distinguishes different types of necessity so um but it doesn't mean that that they will never do this and i'll give you an example of this Uh, i mean do you think that christ assumed uh the same nature that we have yes do you you don't believe in the immaculate conception though right like roman catholic no. right so if if christ assumed the nature that we have and he's consubstantial with us do you think that he had a sinful fallen nature uh well no because sin is not part of our nature it's a corruption of our nature but it's not part of our nature it's like you could still have Jesus the, sin, the-, the sin is not the same thing as the corruption that's two different things well, I agree. Jesus did not assume sin, and he did not assume a sinful nature. But he has the same nature as us. So how is it not a sinful nature? Well, because, like I said, it's not. Um, it's not the the essence of the essence of the human nature. There's no sin in that. So to be truly human, Jesus doesn't have to be. Okay. Uh, doesn't have to have so sin. The thing as a state of sin. Well. Depends on what you mean by state. It's like a it seems like it seems like wordplay to me. It's well, no, because I just think that from the Reformation tradition, infants are in a state of sin because they have concupiscence. Okay, so, so I'm wearing I'm wearing a white shirt right now. I could theoretically splatter spaghetti on it, but my friend could get the same white shirt as me. It doesn't require having the spaghetti splashed all over it. That's like Jesus's nature and our nature. Our nature has been corrupted since no, our nature has been corrupted. Failed analogy because sin is not a substantial thing. Sin is not, it doesn't have being. So to use analogies like the stain or the, the taint of original sin, those are fine as analogies, but they don't work at the level that we're talking about, which is in terms of metaphysics, because sin has no being. It's a deprivation in the sense of moving the will away from the good. So to sin is to act. It's an yeah. act of God's will. So right? the, the, but hold the on. Reason- but infants, but here's the difference here. Infants do not act consciously against god's will 
And that's why the reformers, they knew this. They had to then say to restore, to, to save that Augustinian doctrine of original guilt, they had to then say that concupiscence and the passions are also sin. And that's what I'm taking issue with. And I'm saying that that doesn't make any sense because if the passions are themselves sin, then we all possess sin. And Jesus does as well because Jesus has certain desires and passions because he's consubstantial with us. In Orthodox Church, we don't believe that he has the blameful passions, but he does hunger, he does thirst, he does desire things just like every other human being desires them, although without sin. And so if you equate the desires proper to our human state with sin, then Jesus is also a sinner. Well, Jesus didn't have sinful desires. He had he had normal desires. He had I'm arguing that you have to make the distinctions that I'm making so that you don't say that sin is a state of being. Then you can't have the Calvinist view. Okay, so uh, I'll answer that. I want to go back to the thing like, so is it true that in orthodoxy, you don't believe in that there's original guilt and you also believe that every every choice between good and evil is a truly free will choice. If that's the case, it's theoretically possible for someone to grow up and become an adult and never sin and not need Jesus to die for them. That's what orthodoxy teaches. No, it's not possible because we we inherit a a status uh, that is that does have a proclivity towards sin. Well, then either we really either we don't have free will or it's theoretically possible for us to never sin and not, not need Jesus to die for us. No, that's a false dichotomy because even though I possess that power, it doesn't mean that in the fallen state, I'm going to always exercise that power correctly. So that's the, that's the false equivalence there. Well, like I said, it's like um, the, the first choice someone makes, can they make the right choice the first time? Yes. Second time? Yes. Third time? Yes. So if you say at a certain number of times they can no longer make the right choice, then that means they don't have a free will decision. No, it's a, fa it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a false uh, expectation for me to be able to tell you at what point a person is going to sin. I mean, Paul actually argues this way in Romans where he talks about before he, before he knew about sin, he had no sin. And then when he learned about sin, he then had and took on the desire to want to sin because of the fallen state. So I, that you basically are, you're arguing as if there's not a fallen state. I'm saying there is a fallen state, but because I can't tell you at what point a person will choose sin, doesn't mean that they can never or will never choose sin. It's it's a it's a non sequitur because again we're in the fallen state. It's just simply preserving the fact that sin is, as James says not concupiscence. You understand in the text that James says, he doesn't equate desire with sin. He says, he says sin is when you consent to the desire against God's will, not the desire. And, and we have a free will choice whether or not to consent to the desire every time, right? Yeah. If that's the case, it's possible for someone to never sin. No, it's not. So it's that again, makes no sense. That, that, is a, that is a mathematical contradiction right there. That makes no sense. Two different types of so mathematical contradictions aren't going to apply to the metaphysical domain. This is like that's why I said you could look at Leibniz for different types of necessity. There's not just one type of necessity, right? And this is the, the typical sort of Calvinist dialectical thinking. You can have uh, necessity ex hypothesi, which is what's what it's an example that he gives of this type of a thing where just because something uh, uh, will happen, it doesn't necessitate that you know at what point it's going to happen, right? And, it, and that type of necessity doesn't remove the fact that you're making that choice or that decision, right? So it's kind of like, um, let's bring it back to the question of Christ, right? Like in Christ, because for the Orthodox, the paradigm is always Christ, right? If Christ has the same desires that we have, except for sin, do you admit that he did have desires, right? Like he desired water, food, you know? He of course, could, yeah. He said, he said, I thirst, yes. Yeah. According um, to his humanity, but, not according to his divinity. Wait, what now? According to his humanity, he had right. desires. Yeah. Right. So uh, if desires themselves are sin, though, then or a state of sin, as is the case with the Reformation argument about infants, then when Jesus was desiring when he was a child, wasn't he sinning in those actions? Well, was he desiring sinful things? Well, uh, it doesn't matter because you've already admitted that, as per James 1 in the Reformation tradition, the doctrine is that sin is the desire because uh, that's what makes infants guilty because we're the sons of Adam, you see. So how do we, in other words, the question is, how do we have original guilt for infants? The response of the Reformation tradition is that 
infants have sinful passions and sinful desires. And so the desires themselves are now sin, you see. And I'm saying if Jesus is consubstantial with us, right, because he took on our nature to heal it, to save it, right, then Jesus has the same desires in your view, correct or not? Or do you have to make a distinction between the passions or the desires and the act of sin? That's how so you, you get out of the concupiscence. Go ahead. Concupiscence is a corruption of natural human desires. It's and it, a natural but you're, now you're shying away from saying it's a sin because you know that that's the argument that reformers used to say that infants no, are No, I'm not trying. I've said, I've said many times, desire to sin is sin, but no, not no, no. Desire, desires, passions in infants. Are they sin or, 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 or do they produce guilt? It depends on what the desire is. Desiring food is not sin. Desiring in to steal is sin. Do infants desire to sin? Inf well, the reason that infants are guilty is not necessarily because of what they desire. It's because of inherited guilt, which we do believe in. Well, that's not true because the question is, amongst the reformers, is concupiscence sin? And they desire, say- Desire to sin is no, sin. Yes. No, concupiscence is desire, passions. Desire is plural, right? So it can be desires for all kinds of things. So you're saying that the reformers taught that being hungry is a sin? They taught that the desire, they don't make the distinction is my point. If concupiscence or the passions are sin and make you liable to guilty to guilt, then if Christ possesses the exact same status as other infants by, by a homoousios, then how is Christ not a sinner? How is he not liable to what you're calling? He has the same state of being as the other infants. Well, so Jesus himself said that you know, wanting to, if you, if you desire to like hurt your brother or kill your brother, that's still sin, just as if you actually did. About so on, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, even if you don't actually commit adultery with her, the desire to sin, the desire to commit adultery is still, is still sin. Do you think infants lust after women? They don't do that particular thing, no. So we're talking about infants. We're not talking about adults that consent to sin with their with their. This is just this is just defending the point that desire to sin is sin. It desire itself <laughs> is not sin. No, in the reformers, infants are liable because they have the desires that Adam passed on to his descendants. Concupiscence, the passions are also sin. You already admitted that's a Reformation teaching. It's a Reformation teaching that desire to sin is sin. It's not that desire in general is sin. No, it's the their argument is that concupiscence. What is concupiscence in your view? Concupiscence is desire to sin. And infants possess concupiscence, and that's why they're guilty. I didn't say that the fact that infants possess concupiscence, or if they do, I didn't say that that's why they're guilty. They're guilty because of original sin. They're guilty because they inherited Adam's sin. What does it mean to inherit Adam's sin if not to inherit the concupiscence, which makes them guilty? That's the that Calvin makes this argument in the Institutes when he rejects the Roman Catholic distinction between original sin and original guilt. <coughs> yes, and I'm sure you've seen me rejecting the distinction between original sin and original guilt many times here. Um, That's the point. Yeah, so original sin all in, in Adam all sinned. So that means even before the baby, even if a baby doesn't desire any sin, even if the baby does, even when it's like a single celled embryo in the womb, that cell is not desiring anything, but it's still guilty of sin. How is it guilty of sin if sin is not a state of being? It's guilty of Adam's sin because in some sense, all sin in Adam. This was everything I argued uh, 20 minutes ago that you collapse person into nature. So now I'm guilty for other people's actions because my nature is condemned, correct? You're guilty for other people's actions. Adam. Other people's actions. It's not like Adam is some guy who is like, all of us are united to Adam. All of us may, in some sense, did make the decision to sin in Adam. Again, so now guilt and sinning is not personal. It's natural. It's a state of nature, right? Well, there's you could go into the question of like, are do people have a personal union with, with Adam? Or is it just a union of nature? That there's that well, question. You just argued that it was natural. So right. I mean, for me to be guilty of a sin, it's my nature that is condemned. And that collapses person in the nature. So so you're saying that are you are you saying that because like Augustine the Reformers collapsed person into nature, that's why um 
that's why they so you're saying that the reformers believe all of us are personally united to adam because they collapse person in nature is that why? Yeah, that's when uh Augustine does the exegesis in romans 5 which he mistranslates what it actually says in the greek it does not say all sinned in adam it says all are in adam and that's what led to the effects of adam's sin and you can read Mindorf has a really good exegesis of that and he rebuts the augustinian mistrans because augustine was looking at the latin the Paul's letters written in, in to the Greeks, or it's written to the Romans in Greek. And so Mayendorf, if you look up his exegesis of Romans 5, he points out how this led to this misunderstanding in the West. That, And that's where Augustine brings in the uh, Neoplatonic archetypal imagery to say that everybody is in Adam as in an archetype. He uses this uh, argumentation in City of God. And then that's what leads to the state of nature being itself a condemned and damnable state. And that's what we're saying is that you, this is confusing sin as a state of being with sin as an action. Sin and guilt are not states of being. Evil is not a state of being. Sin is specifically an action of the will. And that's it. That's what James defines it as. And so you can never be guilty for something that you didn't do. And so all of Calvinism is actually predicated on one of these big mistakes here. But I'd like to move on if we can to Christology. Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll conclude by saying... Um, based on what you're saying, I think Augustine was right. I think that all of us did personally sin in Adam and single-celled embryos are guilty of sin. That's what I think. That's what Calvinism teaches. I think you know that's what Calvinism teaches, right? Right. And so, again, that's making my point, the point that I've been making. So that that was what I was trying to make, the point that – thank you. I guess, I guess to summarize my points, like I'll agree with a lot of your premises. I just don't necessarily agree that the logical conclusion of that is the heresies that you attach to that. That's all I was saying. But the her the monoenergism is the teaching in the classical Reformation tradition that the divine will has to overcome the human will because there's a natural antipathy to the human will to the divine will. So Catholics hold, I mean, I, I would say Calvinists hold the councils infallible. You wouldn't believe that. Catholics hold the councils in, as infallible. They also follow Augustine on this issue. So if there's some, like, how do Catholics affirm both if they're contradictory? Because the Augustinian position is a dialectical mode of willing where uh, in Augustine's view, that's why I mentioned libido dominandi earlier, because that's the Augustinian position that the will is either directed towards God in all of its thoughts and actions or it's directed towards creatures. So Augustine thought that if it's ever directed towards creatures, that in some way involves some degree of venial sin, at least, if not mortal sin. This is why Augustine says that even in married life, he doesn't understand how married sex isn't still in some way sinful. He admits that it's a sacrament of the church, but he says, I can't understand how it's not sinful because if I'm enraptured with my wife, I'm willing towards creatures. And so therefore I'm still in some way involved in some degree of sin. So this is a dialectical mode of willing. You're either willing towards God or towards creatures and creatures in some way involve sin. So Catholic, Re Catholic hold to Augustine view. Don't go, they don't go with a lot of this um, nuances that Augustine has because Augustine believes in operative grace and cooperative grace. He thinks that in conversion, there's this operative grace that basically effectually moves the will. And then after that, you have cooperative grace, but he teaches baptismal regeneration. So he's not, I just don't think he's consistent with these different positions to work through. The Eastern church, the Orthodox church never accepted this idea that man's will is so fallen and so, so damaged that he has to have grace replacing his human will and energy. And this becomes a discussion at the Sixth Council when they're debating Christology, because you understand that in our view, in, in Orthodox theology, Christology and the anthropology that's formulated in terms of Christology is one-to-one -one parallel with anthropology in humans and soteriology. So the, the theological positions that we have in Christology are going to determine our soteriology. Reformed theology is backwards. You start with soteriology, and then down the road, you do Christology or you do your Trinitarian theology. For us, everything begins with the person of the Father and the monarchia of the Father. That's why we don't have things like filioque. But...